In 2015, my friend Father Gregory Kent sent me a text. He wanted to invite me to a mass celebrating his 20th anniversary in ministry. And, and I thought, that is so cool. And, and, you know, I wasn't able to make it to the Mass, but I wanted to. And I, he and I texted about that and about what his 20 years in ministry had been like. But I had a second thought, and that second thought is a little bit like pulling the curtain back on what it's like to do the vocational work of God's ministry. Not everything, not everyone knows this, but ministry isn't just worship. It's not just reading the Bible in my study or thinking theological thoughts. Ministry isn't just baptizing people. It can be hard sometimes. And so that second thought that came to my mind was, will I still be there? Will I still be doing this? Because by that point, I had seen so many friends from seminary leave ministry, and I had no idea what the future would hold. I, I didn't know if God would continue calling and sustaining me in this holy work. So my second thought was, what will I be doing in 2024? I, I, I have no idea. Will I even make it? And yet here we are. And as I thought about my calling and these last two decades, I, I, I thought about your calling. And I thought about you and what God is calling you to do. Because God has something for everyone. And I, and I don't want you to misunderstand and take that to mean God has some special blessing set aside just for you. God has some special work set aside for you. God has a holy task that is as unique as you are, as individual as you are. And not all of God's callings look the same. The three, I was going to, I was thinking earlier, I'd say the three of us up here, but Elizabeth is now doing worship and wonder. But the three of us ordained ministers have unique callings in your own church's staff. When Jesus asked, do you love me? We, we need to read these words and dig deep and give serious thought to our answer. The English translation of John 21, 15 to 17, falls unacceptably short of reflecting the depth of Peter's failure. Peter gets a pass in English on this one. It just looks like Jesus is asking him the same question three times because we only have the word love to reflect the various connotations of what love is and can mean. In ancient Koine Greek, there were four words, basically four words, eros for love. Eros, which is romantic love, storge, which is affection or instinctual love, philia, Fraternal love, Philadelphia, Delphi, city, philia, city of. Thank you for those who are still with me. Um, and then the last one, agape, is that unconditional love. And, and here Jesus says, Peter, do you agape me? Do you have unconditional love for me? And Peter says, you're my bro. Lord, you know I feel you. You know that I have a fraternal affection, a deep fraternal affection. Are we ready to respond to Jesus and say, yes, Lord, you know that I agape you. You know that I have unconditional love for you. Or do we hold fast to the life we know? Do we hold fast to the familiar, the life around us, the things that's, that, that, that give us comfort, the things that we know, and do we struggle to surrender? Do we say, yes, Lord, I really like you a lot? When I was young, probably in middle or high school, I thought about ministry. I didn't tell anybody, but I thought about it. I didn't have the words to articulate what I was thinking. I wasn't in a context that invited people, that chose people, that said, you might have a calling. 
I didn't say it to anybody, but in college, I mentioned it to a few people and, and some pastors, and it was my first experience of someone saying to me, you are called by God, and now you need to acknowledge it. I was on a mission trip in, in Chile at the time, and the pastor was someone who, when I first met him, I, I, I saw Christ. It was someone who just seemed to reflect Jesus. And he looked me in the eyes and he said, Usted ha sido llamado por Dios. Ahora tiene que reconciliarlo. You are called. You've got to acknowledge it. And the reason I didn't acknowledge it, the reason I didn't respond at the time, was an issue, really, really my issue, and it's an issue I think our culture has, our 20, 20th century American culture, with the word call. As soon as someone says, I'm thinking about ministry, people often ask, oh, are you called? Well, to that question, I thought, I don't, I, I don't know. No burning bush. No Damascus road. No scales falling from my eyes. Just a dude. I didn't know. The question sounded like it should have an answer. Are you called? You, you, you should know. God works in different ways in different people's lives. And my answer never fit some expectations. God's calling is as unique as each one of us is. It's as unique as you are. And for me, that began a decade of sort of wrestling with that concept off and on. There were plenty of periods where I didn't give it much thought. I worked with homeless people. I worked in finance for the majority of it. I spent a year teaching scuba diving. But in 2004, a few months before our younger son, Eddie, before he was born, I started thinking more about it, more about ministry and seminary and doing God's work. Melanie and I were members of Calvary United Methodist Church, and the pastor's name was Roy Harris. He had a voice like Gilbert Gottfried and the heart of Jesus. On that Sunday, he read John 21, 15 to 17, and after worship, I went up to him and said, I you know, trying to find the right words. I think maybe, perhaps, God might be calling me into ministry. I think so, too, he said. I gave you a warning about his voice. Man, I loved hearing that guy preach. Jesus asked Peter if he loved him. Gape. Three times. And I have no idea, no concept of the number of times the voice of the divine was ringing out, asking if I would surrender everything. Give me your unconditional love and commitment. And all I could say is, I got you, God. Yeah, I philia you. I'm here to give you all the philia I have. It's that sense of withholding that creates a chasm between us and the life of everlasting joy in Jesus. Each one of us has this calling. Each one of us has something God wants us to do. And I can't begin to say that God wants everyone in pastoral ministry. That would be ridiculous, it would be wrong, and it would be audacious. It would be irresponsible and inaccurate because God's calling is as unique as you and God calls people to all kinds of responsibilities. No two are the same, but that message, I don't want you to leave here this morning without hearing me say one more time, God is calling you. When Jesus asks us, do you agape me? We need to be ready for that question. His question is an invitation to accept that calling that is already on your life and live it as fully as you are able, as fully as God gives you strength. Yet this is only part of the process because it would be easy to assume that once you say yes to God, everything is great, life it becomes smooth sailing. If you think that's the case, I don't want to ruin it for you, but I encourage you to read the New Testament. Go ahead and just start with Acts. Skip the gospel and the resurrection and all of that. Go to Acts and see how easy it was for the disciples. Saying yes to God means that 
you're called, it doesn't mean all days are going to be easy. And that's why I was so impressed when Father Gregory texted me. And that's why I wondered about my own future. Because we don't know the future. My plans for this afternoon are an example of this. I thought I was going to be on a red eye to Munich tonight and wake up and they'd all be, it's morning, greeting everyone, guten tag. And I'd be there going, it's two in the morning. That's ministry, though. That, that's, that's responding to God's call. That's listening. That's being open to the changes, the twists and turns along the way, because it's a constant stream of adjustments, reactions, setbacks, blessings, amazement, and wonder. The good and the bad both come. And no matter where we are, Jesus is there. Jesus meets us there. He loves us where we are and is endlessly patient with us. He's patient when, when we willfully refuse to hear his voice. And he's patient when we're too distracted by the siren songs around us to even notice it. He keeps saying, do you agape me? And when we can't or won't, answer. He changes his approach and he meets us where we are. He comes down and he says, do you, do you feel you have me? Do you have fraternal love for me? See, when he met Peter where he was, Peter realized it and it hurt his feelings. The Bible says Peter felt hurt because he asked him a third time. That, that's not quite the whole story. That, technically, that's what the Greek says, but the point is it didn't bother him so much that Jesus was pestering him with this question. Peter noticed that Jesus had just lowered the bar. Jesus had just come down from those high expectations of, do you agape me? To, do you philia me? Peter saw that Jesus saw his inability to be fully committed. But God does that with us all the time. God constantly meets us where we are, where we're capable of responding. And when we realize that God sees us where we are, as we are, and who we are, it's unsettling. No one wants to be exposed. We want things to be hunky-dory. Instead, we get an invitation, a calling to respond, an invitation that brings with it all these ups and downs, twists and turns. And this simple exchange in John 21 between Jesus and Peter is the summation of God's call. It encompasses where we are and where God wants us to be. Each one of us, and you could repeat it with me, is called by God. But it's up to us to say, yes, Lord. You know, I agape you. Say yes to your calling today and live fully with God. Amen.